Hello, and welcome to The Corporate Casket, a bi-weekly series where bad businesses go to die. We will discuss any and everything from bad charities, terrible CEOs, and businesses that have a lot to hide. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be talking about a charity called Teach for America. Now, Teach for America is a nonprofit that receives hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue, all for the mission of furthering education in low-income areas. They, quote, enlist, develop, and mobilize as many as possible of our nation's most promising future leaders to grow and strengthen the movement for educational equity and excellence, end quote. Basically, they encourage and incentivize recent college graduates and professionals to teach in economically disadvantaged communities so that students in those areas have more access to professionals in their aspiring field, or so that there's more educators there in general to help that kid's potential. And this sounds great on the surface, and there's a lot of good that Teach for America has done, but today we're not just covering the good, we're going to cover the good, the bad, and unfortunately, some of the ugly. So let's dive right in and start with this nonprofit's history. Teach for America isn't a very old nonprofit. It's been around for only about 30 years. According to one source, Teach for America was founded by Wendy Kopp, who first conceived the idea in her senior thesis at Princeton University. With the goal of getting highly competent college graduates to make a two-year commitment to teach in struggling schools, Kopp raised $2.5 million in order to begin recruiting college students and professionals to become what TFA called corp members. Funds for the salaries of Corps members were provided by local school districts and by grants from AmeriCorps, a service network of which TFA was a member. In 1990, TFA sent 500 teachers into six regions across the country. By 2008, the organization had more than 5,000 Corps members and 12,000 alumni and had expanded to 26 regions across the country, including cities such as New York, Houston, and Los Angeles as well as rural areas such as Eastern North Carolina and the Mississippi Delta. At the beginning of the 21st century, it was one of the largest employers of recent college graduates in the United States. TFA fostered a reputation for being highly selective. Although core members come from a variety of backgrounds and have degrees in fields other than education, all have demonstrated significant academic achievement and leadership ability. Upon completion of the program, TFA core members receive teaching certification. In some regions, core members have the option of earning a master's degree in education as they go through the program. Although you might not think that a nonprofit should be highly selective in most contexts, at least in terms of their employees, this is one case where I agree they have a right to be picky about who becomes a core member. After all, they are teaching children. If you're not going to be selective in choosing someone for a childcare position, then what would you be selective in? You know what I mean? Also, one thing worth noting that will come up again later is that though these teachers may not have a background in education, they do partake in a five-week training program known as Institute to prepare for the classroom. We'll get into that a little bit later and see if it's really enough preparation for them. The point is, in only four years, Teach for America was apparently working with 45,000 students and 90% of principals rated core members teaching as good or excellent in a national survey in 1999. It's pretty rare that I see a company or nonprofit grow quite this quickly, but the need was very clearly there. The values at Teach for America clearly resonated with a lot of people. They state on their website that, in all we do, we act on the following beliefs. Diversity is crucial for successful change efforts and is one of Teach for America's greatest strengths. The full potential of our diverse network will be reached only when we are an inclusive community. The predictability of success or failure of our students or individuals in our organization should not correlate with any social, cultural, or other identity-based factors. And again, I'm all for this. Everyone should have an equal opportunity for education. And I think it's a shame that this isn't the case in this country. So the fact that Teach for America was established to try and give everyone the same chance to help students that really need it, that's a worthwhile cause. And I do wanna commend them for that. According to some studies though, not only was this movement growing, it was effective. One paper published by the Urban Institute in 2008 reads, TFA teachers outperformed the control teachers, including experienced teachers in student math achievement. The impact of five TFA teachers and control teachers was no different in reading achievement. When TFA teachers were compared with novice control teachers, the impact on math achievement was larger than when compared to the full teacher control group. And reading remained insignificant. 
Kane, Rockoff, and Steger used six years of data and found a small positive effect for TFA on student math achievement relative to certified teachers controlling for years of teaching experience. The effect was somewhat smaller for elementary school teachers and larger for middle school teachers. They also found that the returns to experience were greater for TFA teachers than traditionally certified teachers, though not statistically significant. The experience differentials overall were small, such that even a small difference in effectiveness may offset turnover. The findings have important implications for the recruitment and selection aspects of human resource management in education, at least for secondary school teachers. They stress the likely importance of strong academic backgrounds for secondary school teachers. They also suggest that policymakers should focus more on issues of teacher selection and less on issues of teacher retention if the concern is the performance of disadvantaged secondary school students, especially in math and science. In short, they suggest that programs like TFA that focus on recruiting and selecting academically talented recent college graduates and placing them in schools serving disadvantaged students can help reduce the achievement gap, even if teachers stay in teaching only a few years. The thing is, as this paper states in the beginning, teachers at TFA aren't obligated to stick around very long and many of them don't. One source in 2016 states, though TFA says that 65% of its alumni work full-time in education and that 84% of alumni work full-time in roles impacting education, nationally, TFA teachers also have high turnover rates. A Mathematica policy research study last year indicated that nearly 90% of TFA teachers do not see themselves teaching for the rest of their careers, whereas 26.3 of non-TFA teachers do. I'm not saying TFA teachers should stick with education in the long term. That's obviously up to them. After all, the numbers from this study prove that even though TFA educators may only be temporary, it is still helpful and it's certainly better than nothing. Expecting TFA to solve education is unrealistic. They're providing some small help to a community that needs it, trying to alleviate a problem much bigger than themselves. However, that's where my critique with them starts to come into play. The TFA may have been extremely well-intentioned and the data shows, hey, they were helping people out, but their intentions did start to flounder after a time and they've since been accused of undermining the education sector with their elitist attitudes. So let's start talking about the criticism and see where things may have gone wrong. An article by Olivia Blanchard called I Quit Teach for America came out in 2013. Beneath the headline, it reads, five weeks of training was not enough to prepare me for a room of 20 unruly elementary schoolers. This is one of TFA's largest criticisms. These teachers may have the best of intentions, but with no background in education, that spells disaster. Not to mention the TFA's attitude, according to Olivia, seems to shift from one of, we'd like to help these communities to a, we can do better than you. The article reads, the phrase closing the achievement gap is the cornerstone of TFA's general philosophy, public relations messaging and training sessions. As a member of the 2011 Corps, I was told immediately and often that one, the achievement gap is a pervasive example of inequality in America, and two, it is our personal responsibility to close the achievement gap within our classrooms, which are microcosms of America's educational inequality. But between those two messages lies the unspoken logic that current non-TFA teachers and schools are failing at the task of closing the achievement gap through some combination of apathy or incompetence. Although TFA seminars and presentations never explicitly accuse educators of either, the implication is strong within the program's very structure. Recruit high achieving college students, train them over the summer and send them into America's lowest performing schools to make it right. The subtext is clear. Only you can fix what others have screwed up. It was an implication I noticed when an email I received during Institute, the five week training program, referring to a system of students who have simply not been taught. The email explained, that's really what the achievement gap is. For all the external factors that may or may not add challenges to our students' lives, mostly it is because they really and truly have not been taught and therefore are years behind where they need to be. I later asked a TFA spokesperson if this email reflects the organization's official views on traditionally trained teachers. He denied that TFA believes the shortcomings of public education to be the fault of teachers. If anything, he added, teachers are victims of more structural problems, inequitable funding, inadequate systems of training and supporting teachers, the absence of strong school and district leadership. 
Nonetheless, at the time, the dramatic indictment of America's non-TFA teachers would stay with me as I headed into the scandal-ridden Atlanta public school system. Now, I really don't want to accuse the TFA of anything here. I don't know their tone. I didn't read that email and Olivia could be biased, obviously. However, this does play into their elitist attitude later. I agree that teachers are victims of the structural problems in the education system as much as anyone else. Yet, if TFA is using that as some sort of reasoning on why they're a better alternative or better leaders, then that's also a bit messed up. Olivia states that their system, the TFAs, causes a rift between the core members and traditional teachers. Yet, even worse than that, she wasn't prepared to handle the kids themselves. She had few insights or resources on dealing with preteen boys that were fighting at recess and difficult parents because TFA's training is far too broad to encompass all of these situations. I can't really say I'm surprised though. In a five-week training program, how could you figure it all out? How could a five-week training program realistically include even half of the things that a degree in education does? This might be just me thinking out loud, but I feel like in order to better work with and for traditional educators, Teach for America should have been geared towards teachers, aides, or tutors, rather than having these core members going off into giant unruly classrooms alone, maybe they should act as an extra set of hands for teachers that need the help. Olivia continues and writes, I was not alone in my trouble with student behavior. Gary Rubenstein, a 1991 TFA alum and an outspoken critic of the organization, believes the training sets teachers up for failure. TFA teachers don't know how to deal with discipline problems because they never dealt with a class with more than 10 kids. There's no way to deal with so many potential problems when they've never been practiced. Jessica Smith, a core member I recently called up, agrees. I've struggled with behavior management, she admits. As with all the names of teachers I spoke with for the article, Jessica is a pseudonym. Though training includes some instruction in student discipline, I really didn't have the training to know how to give consequences consistently, Jessica said. I asked if she reached out for support. I think I talked to every person I knew to talk to, even our region's executive director, Jessica recalled. Although TFA ultimately did send in a behavior management expert, the person who finally came in to help me came at the end of February for a 20 minute session. Is this a representative experience? It's hard to say. We provide training in behavioral management techniques, a TFA spokesperson said when asked about Jessica, but core members are expected to adapt their training to their unique school culture. We also provide continued support for core members who have trouble fitting in. Jessica has decided to not return to TFA for a second year. Yes, a commitment matters, she wrote, but staying isn't necessarily helpful to your kids or anybody. Jessica said that after she notified local TFA leadership of her decision, the reaction was severe. They chewed out my character and made personal allegations, she said. She was told, she recalls, that she would personally have to deal with remorse and regret. And this bothers me for quite a few reasons. I can't speak on if TFA is ill-intentioned, but at the very best, they're ill-prepared. Olivia states that TFA, even more so than the public school system, is designed to teach for the test. They apparently strongly encourage their teachers to base their class's big goals around standardized test scores. Maybe so that if students do well on these tests, TFA can continue to present their ideas to donors and potential teachers as proof that they're doing well in these school systems. Again, that's just my speculation. I'm not saying this scenario is true under every traditional teacher or under every core member. But the fact is that while the TFA teachers may have done all right according to the numbers, the difference between them and traditional teachers was relatively small. So perhaps they're effective in teaching for the test, but they sound far less effective in teaching to help a kid grow and learn. Not to mention their data we discussed may not be accurate in the first place. The article also states, TFA's ability to rate the performance of its own teachers has been heavily criticized. A Reuters article in 2012 pointed out that TFA's 2010 federal grant of $50 million was based on the organization's internal data, showing that 41% of its first year teachers and 53% of its second year teachers advanced their students by an impressive 1.5 to two years in a single school year. When asked about the origins of these statistics, TFA's former research director, Heather Harding, admitted that many teachers provide performance statistics based on self-designed assessments. Reuters quoted Harding saying, I don't think it stands up to external research scrutiny. 
The TFA spokesperson maintains that the comment was taken out of context and that Simon was merely pointing out that internal research referenced a giant application that does not meet the same level of rigor as external research. Although both show the positive impact our core members are having on students. Whether or not the numerical data is broadly accurate, I can attest to the pressure within TFA to produce proof of students' gains without much oversight or guidance. Stephanie Simon is the author of this Reuters article, and I've got to say, the TFA really seems to want to downplay what her article said. Stephanie wasn't simply questioning if the TFA's research stood up to scrutiny. The title of her article is, Has Teach for America Betrayed Its Mission? Stephanie says the TFA has had to abandon unproven claims that nearly half its teachers achieve outstanding academic gains with students, which leaves the pivotal question of its effectiveness unresolved. And you know, I love data. So show me those numbers, income disclosures, tax forms. That's where I find the smoking gun against MLMs because you can, you know, make pretty words, but the numbers, they're just gonna say what they are. Therefore, when I saw those numbers from the Urban Institute earlier, I expected that this episode may not have much in the way of scandals and controversies. Yet a lot of these articles say those numbers can't even be trusted. And a lot of air quotes here, but their data, quote, quote, is allegedly pretty damn questionable. And this Reuters article puts a few of its own numbers out there when Stephanie writes, In the early years, TFA nearly collapsed several times from insolvency when it began to land grants from corporations and foundations, among its biggest funders, the Walton family, heirs to the Walmart fortune. A tax exempt nonprofit, TFA reported annual operating surpluses of 35 million, 114 million, and 37 million in its last three federal filings. COP, who earns $375,000 a year, supervises 1,800 employees, including a small army of recruiters. Eager to bring in more low income and minority candidates, TFA no longer sticks to elite colleges. Recruiters also urge veterans and mid-career professionals to apply. TFA retains its competitive prestige by rejecting 90% of applicants. The recruits are paid a standard starting salary by their school district during their two year teaching stint. To offset costs, TFA requires each district that hires its teachers to pay a negotiated fee, typically $2,000 to $5,000 per teacher per year. Before agreeing to send recruits to a region, TFA often lines up additional subsidies for local businesses, philanthropies, or state government. In Mississippi, for instance, TFA laid out a plan to send 700 recruits to the impoverished Delta, but said it would need $12 million from the state plus $3,000 per teacher from local school districts to subsidize that growth. The legislature came up with just $6 million this year, enough to bring in 370 teachers. Still, local TFA director, Ron Nuremberg said he considers that a victory given that the state was cutting everyone else's budget. A few states have recently reduced grants to TFA because of fiscal pressures, but taxpayer funding still brought in $64 million in the fiscal year 2009 to 2010, about a third of TFA's revenue, tax records show. The teachers unions and some community leaders argue that public money could be better spent at a time when schools are laying off teachers and cutting academic programs. Apparently in 2010, the Obama administration also awarded them a $50 million federal grant. I definitely question this $375,000 salary for sure, even though it's remarkably not the worst we've seen either. But what TFA did in Mississippi especially rubs me the wrong way. The state was cutting everyone else's budget and Mississippi has a massive, massive teacher shortage to begin with. So why is TFA, a nonprofit, demanding this many millions from them? I know the teachers need to be paid, absolutely, but it still feels excessive to me. However, before we get into the betraying their missions argument, I want to mention one more comment from Olivia on The Atlantic that I think speaks volumes about what TFA presents to the people versus reality. On its website, TFA makes a bold claim that by the end of Institute, core members have developed a foundation of knowledge, skills, and mindsets needed to be effective beginning teachers. Training is supposed to include teaching for an average of two hours each day, observed by experienced teachers, extensive lesson planning instruction, and constant opportunities for feedback. Personally, I taught two 90 minute classes per week, a far cry from 10 hours per week described in the publicity materials, and experienced teachers usually meant new TFA alumni with two years experience. 
And it's time to take a quick break to thank today's sponsor, Daily Harvest. Sometimes I just do not have the energy to cook and sometimes eating healthy can get a little bit difficult, especially when you have all of these apps just waiting to deliver you fast food and other crap to your door. And honestly, I don't really feel great afterwards when I end up eating takeout. It, I just don't feel good. Maybe that's just me, but I feel like crap afterwards. I just wanna like lay down and take a nap and then be groggy the rest of the night. But that changed when I started using Daily Harvest harvest because Daily Harvest delivers delicious food built on organic fruits and vegetables right to your door. It takes minutes to prepare and I don't have to think twice if the food I'm eating is good for me. And Daily Harvest is ready when you are. Everything stays fresh and in your freezer until you're ready to enjoy it. And that includes smoothies, flatbreads, or harvest bowls and soups. And Daily Harvest never uses preservatives, added sugars, or artificial anything, including their recently launched almond milk, which is made up of only almonds and a dash of sea salt. And it's super super convenient to stock up and just throw that into your smoothie blends. So if you wanna get started today with Daily Harvest, make sure to go to dailyharvest.com and enter promo code casket to get $25 off your first box. Again, that's promo code casket for $25 off your first box at dailyharvest.com. Again, make sure to go to dailyharvest.com, use code casket. Thank you for sponsoring today's Corporate Casket. In more recent years, there's also been alumni and critics alike stepping forward to say that TFA has lost sight of its mission completely. A TFA alumni, Gary Rubenstein, says how TFA is now serving charter schools, which defeats the purpose of the TFA to begin with. Why send their teachers to charter schools, which are publicly funded but privately managed, when their entire mission was to serve public schools in low-income areas in the first place? ProPublica states, when the Walton Family Foundation announced in 2013 that it was donating $20 million to Teach for America to recruit and train nearly 4,000 teachers for low-income schools, its press release did not reveal the unusual terms for the grant. Documents obtained by ProPublica show that the foundation, a staunch supporter of Schools Choice and Teach for America's largest private funder, was paying $4,000 for every teacher placed in a traditional public school and $6,000 for everyone placed in a charter school. The two-year grant was directed at nine cities where charter schools were sprouting up, including New Orleans, Memphis, and Los Angeles. The gift's purpose was far removed from Teach for America's original mission of alleviating teachers' shortages in traditional public schools. It was intended to generate a longer-term leadership pipeline that advances the education movement, providing a source of talent for policy, advocacy, and politics, as well as quality schools and new entrepreneurial ventures, according to internal grant documents. The incentives corresponded to a shift in Teach for America's direction. Although only 7% of students go to charter schools, Teach for America sent almost 40% of its 6,736 teachers to them in 2018, up from 34% in 2015 and 13% in 2008. In some large cities, charter schools employ the majority of TFA teachers, 54% in Houston, 58% in San Antonio, and at least 70% in Los Angeles. Jeffrey Hennig, a professor at the Teachers College, Columbia University, and author of a book about education research and charter school policy said, these billionaire school reformers and the foundations with which they are allied really have become much more sophisticated in the way they strategically use their funding. And this is an absolute disappointment. NPR also spoke about this fairly recently in 2019. The thing is, I understand why TFA would want to accept that money from Waltons. $20 million is no small number and nothing to scoff at. But if it betrayed their core mission and they still went with it, then I really have to question the integrity of all those that took it. What TFA did may not be illegal, but they took all this money only to go morally bankrupt instead. This grant agreement gave them more money for charter school teachers. And well, honestly, this only makes me curious as to what the hell the Walton Family Foundation is doing behind closed doors. NPR explains that they support charter schools, but for them to band together with TFA and spread their mission in this way, it's a really shady situation. Now, there's some speculation from NPR about if this could possibly hurt TFA's credibility, and a statement from the Walton Family Foundation is actually a supporter of NPR itself. I can't say for sure if this has really hurt their credibility, but if I have to guess, I say it's a culmination of quite a few things. One story from the Washington Post says that TFA's diversity gains have come at the expense of teachers of color, and they reference Terenda White's article called Teach for America's Paradoxical Diversity Initiative, 
Race, Policy, and Black Teacher Displacement in Urban Public Schools. I downloaded the article to take a look at what Terenda White had to say, and I highly recommend you take a look too if you're more interested in that too. But a couple interesting sections here on page two, she says, in 2016, Teach for America celebrates its 25th anniversary. As one of the nation's top recruiters of college students into urban schools throughout the country, the organization will likely celebrate a host of accomplishments, including its longevity and expansion over time, its financial growth and political influence in the realm of education reform, and its impact largely contested on the educational lives of children in low-income communities of color. One of TFA's taken for granted successes will likely include teacher diversity, one of its celebrated core values that is evident in recent gains among core members from racial diverse backgrounds. While for most of its history, the organization recruited from the nation's top predominantly white institutions and universities, it shifted gears in the mid 2000s to increase recruitment at state colleges and historically black colleges and universities. These changes improved the percentage of core members of color, such that the organization reports dramatic growth in diversity from 27% in 2005 to nearly 40% in 2014. In light of the growing population of students of color in US schools, nearly half of all students in US public schools were students of color in 2014, while teachers of color represented 17% a diversity initiative on part of TFA is timely and important. TFA's celebration of diversity, however, will likely address its numerical gains in the representation of core members of color, but not the relationship of these gains to the larger realities of teachers of color in regions where core members are placed. Indeed, the expansion of Teach for America in urban spaces has coincided with high rates of decline among teachers of color, particularly black teachers. As described on its website, in response to a frequently asked question, do TFA core members take jobs from veteran teachers? The organization details its contracts with district partners, including agreements between the organization and districts, rather than between core members and schools, agreements that prohibit direct replacement of existing teachers and open competition for jobs based on qualifications and standard hiring processes. Observers note, however, that hiring processes in district schools are influenced nonetheless by airtight contracts between districts and TFA leaders and leave little room for principals to negotiate whom they hire. Others point to the financial bargain of hiring seemingly inexpensive TFA core members, which undermines regional competition for jobs as principals look to save money in times of recession and thus favor TFA novices with short-term commitments. First of all, I have to give Terenda some amazing credit because she doesn't attack TFA, but truly tries to examine every nuance of the issue. Secondly, this article examines the relationship between not just TFA and principals, but many different states and the teachers of color within them. Even if TFA wasn't originally founded to take away jobs from traditional teachers, that has happened with little doubt. Even if TFA may have diversity in their numbers, their improvement in that area, as Terenda puts it, coincides with a drastic decline in the number of teachers of color and black teachers in particular in the very cities where TFA has expanded. These teacher layoffs and school closures where teachers of color disproportionately work are most likely benefiting TFA in a way they don't want to publicly acknowledge. There's far more to it than just numbers though. There's also TFA's approach. As Terenda again explains, for TFA, the managerialism and the technocratic approach excludes a serious discussion about these larger systemic problems, poverty, segregation, and unequal funding. When I was a TFA core member, I really believed that if I just had perfect lesson plans, then these larger problems wouldn't matter. The technocratic approach is just about test scores and making them go up, and it's disconnected from these larger questions. How do we involve parents? And do they have any say in what a good school is? Are they a part of these turnaround models? Do they get any kind of voice? I think the whole community-based model of schooling is very much being lost to a top-down managerial approach. Who is the manager? Where are you from and do you understand this community? And what do you mean when you talk about great teachers? Does your definition include values like being socially aware, responsive and empathetic and understanding a community and its students? I think TFA has an ideology and they push that ideology at the expense of other important ways of improving schools. And at times they're not just indifferent, but hostile to these more systemic approaches to improving schools. Again, it's worth noting here that I'm sure these results and reactions fluctuate from place to place, depending on the teacher. Some might stick around, some don't. Like with any educational topic, whether it's homework or the history of traditional schools, it really just depends. 
If you've had a fantastic experience with a teacher from TFA, I don't wanna diminish that. But their attitude as a nonprofit and as a whole does worry me a bit. Just because someone has a degree in mathematics doesn't mean they can teach a math class. Teaching involves far more than just knowledge of the subject. I think Teach for America could be great if it was utilized properly, whether it was to provide a substitute teacher for the year to a school that may be struggling to find a genuine long-term teacher or a teacher's assistant or something of that nature. It's not like they don't have the resources to do that. It just feels like their original vision has been lost this past decade, especially when they not only accepted the condition of working with privately run schools, but began to push out long-term teachers of color in communities that they were supposed to be helping in the first place. That article by Terenda will be in my sources, of course, but you know, I just don't want you taking my word for it. You can absolutely go through it. It's 42 pages of one hell of a wonderful read. Now, the last thing I want to touch on is also the TFA's approach to conflict and a bit more about their recent attitude. As the organization has continued to expand, both supporters and critics have called for more transparency. People are troubled by the public dollars going to the TFA at the rate teachers are being let go, and it's obviously understandable. In 2011, TFA founder Wendy Kopp spoke on a Seattle radio station, saying that people often misunderstand the function of TFA. We're a leadership development organization, not a teaching organization, she said. I think if you don't understand that, of course it's easy to tear the whole thing apart. Wendy, love, darling. Your name is Teach for America. If you're a leadership organization, then call yourself LFA, Lead for America instead. I think what angered me so much here about this comment is that Wendy seems to imply that they're developing leaders when they send these new graduates and these cores off to schools. Leadership skills shouldn't be developed at the expense of kids learning. It's not about these core learning leadership. TFA should be about children getting the skills they need to be successful in life. What about that education gap that they kept talking about before? Wasn't that their mission in the first place? If you're trying to support people as leaders, then put them in a competitive field or something, not a classroom. And if the argument from Wendy is that she's trying to help children develop leadership skills as opposed to teaching them, then do that outside of a classroom too. A classroom is a place for learning and take it from someone who literally my undergrad degree is leadership communication. This is not something appropriate to teach a child who's in fourth grade. A fourth grader should be learning the building blocks to be able to create more complex thought processes in their mind as they mature in life. This is not the time to be like, hey, let's go through the moral dilemma of the teaching economy right now in the US. That's not the time for it. Right now, these kids need the appropriate building blocks and that was supposed to be the purpose of the TFA so that these kids can go on to compete with everyone else on a fair and level playing field. And the fact that they don't seem to care about that anymore is a little disturbing and sad. I think all of this as a whole just proves to me that TFA has completely lost its way. And in recent years, they have absolutely proven that. In 2019 in Oakland, California, teachers were on strike for better pay. One teacher stating that she barely survives on a $55,000 salary in California. She couldn't afford childcare costs, so her mother watches her son while she's at school teaching. More than 100,000 public school teachers in six states took part in walkouts demanding higher pay. Yet TFA's educator placement program suggested they should cross the picket line, ignore the strike, or they'd risk losing thousands of dollars at the end of their service. Peyton Carter, a 1999 Teach for America alumni and current Oakland teacher said he was outraged that members may lose an award worth $2,000 to $10,000, a financial incentive the nonprofit it uses as a recruiting tool. We feel it's really unethical and unfair use of the funding as basically financial leverage to coerce them into crossing the picket line, Carter said. No TFA core member would willingly do that because of the professional damage to relationships. Spokesman Jack Hardy said Teach for America didn't provide recommendations on what its 58 teachers should do in the school district, where a possible strike would affect 36,000 students. He said there's a misunderstanding on the guidance it communicated outlining rules from AmeriCorps, a federal service program that bans striking and provides the awards after teachers apply for them at the end of their two-year service agreement. We don't have a position on the strike or organizing. Our core members, we stand behind them. We stand beside them. Our goal is to help them be successful, Hardy said. Will Corvin is in the second year of his Teach for America stint and said all of the core members working with him at Oakland High School chose to be in the union. The history teacher said he wants to support the possible strike to get better work conditions for all teachers and to show his appreciation for the colleagues who have helped him by sharing their lesson plans, curriculum, and mentorship. 
I really want to help these veteran teachers who helped me so much and also help myself by getting a better wage, Corvin said. Teach for America is by default forcing its members to make a political decision without a choice, said Ismail Armendariz, first vice president of the Oakland Education Association, which represents about 3000 teachers, who is a special education teacher and a 2012 alumni of Teach for America. It's also a political action to cross the picket line, he said. This is just yet another controversy from TFA, another time they've found themselves in hot water. Not to mention yet another example where this rift between traditional teachers and TFA core members can develop. If the TFA members are being told to work during these walkouts, now don't get me wrong, there's been plenty of support for TFA too, but it seems very surface level. For example, Bernie Sanders said in 2011 that when we have highly qualified teachers, we don't want all those teachers being in upper middle-class neighborhoods, educating kids to go to Harvard and Yale. The thing is, I don't know how much Bernie Sanders knew about TFA when he made this statement, but my problem is that the TFA core aren't highly qualified teachers. I agree with this general sentiment that every community deserves a well-qualified teacher, but I disagree with TFA when they say their members meet those standards. They simply don't. Even Olivia, who we mentioned earlier, by her own admission, had no idea how to handle arguing boys at recess. Harvard Magazine has also published an article about TFA questioning if the organization is good for America. Their most cited concerns are the ones we've already mentioned. TFA teachers are ill-prepared, they leave too soon, and they belittle and take veteran teachers' jobs. I'd say the last one is probably my biggest frustration, but the fact is none of them look great. Even if I said these temporary teaching positions and the high turnover rate isn't the biggest deal, I don't want it to come across as a non-issue either. It absolutely does matter. I guess it just starts to feel like this is another thing to throw on the pile and some issues seem far more pressing. A self-described TFA resistance movement has appeared led by some of its own alumni. These former core members say their youthful idealism was cynically co-opted by a group that in the big picture acts as the detriment of public education. TFA seems to be training their core to believe in a simple narrative that public schools are irreparably damaged. Bad teachers and bureaucracy are to blame. And our only salvation is by diminishing the union, innovating and creating systems of choice and competition, says Beth Sondel, a former TFA teacher who is now an education professor at North Carolina State University. I agree with the TFA that the education system needs help badly, but I don't think TFA is the solution either. They have the potential to help, but even that's been a struggle for them. I do truly hope that TFA can get back on track to do some good, though I won't hold my breath either. Right now, it feels like they're doing more hurting than helping. But with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, make sure to leave a like, follow, subscribe, wherever you're listening to this so that you can stay up to date with all the latest uploads. Thank you so much for tuning in to another Corporate Casket and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.